All right, so we'll uh, get started again. Uh, two things uh, I want to do here. Uh, first is uh, over the next first 45 minutes uh, or so, I just want to actually do a more practical hands-on like tips and tricks and things you should think about as you're actually making information graphics or visualizations uh, that covers just some basic things around design, uh, annotation, illustrations, charting forms that hopefully will be helpful to you. And then at the end of it, uh, I'll do a brief little demo walking you through a little bit of how D3, which is a JavaScript library uh, that was written by Mike Bostock, uh, that's used uh, to do a lot of these sort of interactive, more complex data visualizations online, a, little bit, a brief demo of how that works. And there's a couple of tutorials from Mike uh, that you can go do on your own to actually learn how to make a chart or learn how to make a map. Uh, but we'll, you can, we'll get the general principles. Uh, you can follow along if you want, um, uh, but I didn't want to spend this entire session having all of us just spend an hour fiddling about with trying to get HTML running and figuring out why missing closing tags in HTML or breaking things or uh, fiddling about with JavaScript. So hopefully this is a mix of some good tips um, and ways to think about things, along with a little bit of demo uh, and inspiration on how you can do some of this yourself and see how it works. Um, so first, I uh, want to talk a little bit about how we think actually about designing graphics. And I'll talk about this more from the point of uh, static graphics, like we'd run in print, um, and just sort of common elements and common things that we think about. Um, and, uh, up first, really much is like, what are the actual elements of a graphic that we uh, consider, and how do we think actually about labeling things and communicating with people? Um, and so this is just a graphic that ran about, uh, it was about changes to Ebola protection uh, by, that were worn by US hospital workers, um, where uh, actually Larry Buchanan, who's one of our graphics editors, is actually the man in the Ebola suit. We uh, managed to uh, work with the hospital to uh, get the different types of suits. But just a few things to point out about this. Um, one thing you'll almost always see on our graphics um, is there's a re pretty standard form of a uh, headline up at top that describes what the graphic is. Then we have something that we call the read-in, which is usually one or two sentences that we try to use to explain, like, what are we actually showing he people here? Why should you care about this? Um, we think a lot about keeping both of those very tight and focused and clear. Uh, the lead-in is almost, this is actually probably one of the longest lead-ins you'll ever see on a graphic. Um, because we don't want to actually bog people down before they get into it, but we do actually want to use that to, as a reason to explain, like, why are we actually showing you this uh, graphic or this chart? Uh, what is actually interesting to look at in here? Um, we have a type hierarchy that we use. Um, it is pretty simple, generally. Um, one thing you also notice if you look at graphics in the Times is that um, we almost always use uh, a pretty small set of fonts and typography. Um, headlines are always, we use Franklin Gothic as our font. It's a sans serif font. You can use any font you want. Um, but it's uh, very much a, we have a bold headline. The type on our graphics is all about nine point type. Um, there's a little bit of hierarchy in terms of the graphics, in terms of type sizes. Headlines are usually about 12 or 14 points. We have things like subheads that are usually about 10 points. The type is just normal sans serif type about uh, nine points. Um, and we think a lot about what are the sort of, what's the hierarchy of the graphic look like in terms of uh, headlines, subheads, and then sort of subordinate parts of the graphic. Um, another thing too is often um, there'll be some sort of dominant image that's actually used in that graphic um, as sort of a visual hook for people and really sort of emphasize on what's most important. Um, and so like in this one again, like your dominant image is a sort of sequence of like, here's your three different types of uh, suits. And then your other imagery uh, for the, uh, about the process of removing the protective gear is smaller. And I think that's a pattern you see a lot uh, if you look at our stuff, is that in any sort of graphic that involves a number of different visualizations or charts or maps, um, there's usually one that we really want to say, uh, this is the focus of the graphic and really focus on designing around uh, that image in a way that like hooks Peter readers into that and then the other uh, data around it is kind of supplementary or complementary to that. Um, because what you can end up with is if you end up with trying to put too much of the same size on the graphic, it's unclear as to like what parts you think are the most important to the reader and what parts um, are less important. So you can use the size of your imagery or charts 
to actually communicate importance uh, there too. Uh, another big thing, and this is one of the things we see all the time in uh, academic papers and also charts that often come out of charting programs, um, is that we try almost always to label right on the chart. You see a lot of bar graphs like this. This is a random one from the internet, where it's a uh, percentage of people who are obese by college education. Um, where you have to, if you're actually trying to look at this, there's this constant tension of like your eye is going over here, like you're in the men, 27, you got over there, oh, college graduates are the dark ones, some colleges are like this bouncing back and forth. Um, if we were to do a graphic like that in the paper, um, we'd do it much more like this, where um, we're actually putting those labels and lining them up right with the chart so that you can actually just read across and read it. You don't actually have to go uh, over and uh, <coughs> try and bounce back and forth between a key and the image. So anytime you can avoid having a key because you can put the labels right on the chart, uh, go for it. Uh, annotation is another huge thing that we think about. Um, this is an example from uh, Edward Tufte's book, uh, Visual Explanations, and this is a similar type of thing. Often you see figures where it's like, you have labels A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, and then you have to refer off to a key. Much, much more effective to think, can I just put my labels right on the image itself? Uh, similarly with annotations, um, uh, this is the whale graphic we talked about. Um, this chart actually has a lot of the information that we ran in the graphic in print down here, where it has up here A, B, C, D, E, describing the different stages of the feeding and the speed in miles per hour. But you actually have to refer down here to this sort of detailed line of the figure. And you read that, you look up there, you read that, you look down there. Um, in our graphic, um, we actually took that and uh, instead of having one chart um, that you then had to bounce back and forth between images, uh, a chart with multiple lines that tied to different stages and then the key down at the bottom, we wanted to put the actual annotations that explained what was going on, that text right next to that point of the chart uh, and the image of that whale. So think about like the importance of actually annotations and helping guide people through. You wanna make it as easy as people uh, as it can be for them to understand what's going on when you're uh, plotting something. And having that text label or that little annotation that points directly to where you're plotting, you can read that, uh, is really, really helpful. Um, similarly, uh, this is a graphic we did about state uh, gun laws that were enacted in the year since the shooting in Newtown. Um, let's see a closer up version of it. Um, and it basically looked at uh, all of the laws that were pro uh, proposed across all the states. Uh, this is actually a tremendous sort of research project by Karen Urich, one of our graphics editors. Uh, and when they were introduced, when they passed, uh, if they actually were enacted or not. Um, and we looked at laws that loosen gun restrictions and laws that tighten it. But one of the things we wanted to do is, um, part of this was to show sort of the pattern of how quickly different types of laws had gotten passed um, and which ones were still ringing out there. But we also wanted to like, provide some specific examples that would help people understand what we're actually showing. So a number of them, uh, these lines on here showing this sort of timelines actually point out, uh, like give you a description of like, this is a law in Illinois, this is something that's going on in Tennessee to really kind of uh, help people understand what that data is actually showing uh, in a way that is not keeping the data completely separate from the description of what it is. Visual hierarchy is another big thing to think about. Um, this is a graphic that ran on the op-ed section showing all the uh, deaths in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and it's a uh, great graphic in that it like, makes a point just in terms of the number of people who were killed there. But in terms of actually helping people understand any patterns, the fact that you have this page where you have, that is full of icons of about the same size doesn't really help in terms of communicating any visual hierarchy in terms of uh, what you should take away from patterns or not. Instead, it's just, it gives you, this is a more impressionistic piece. It gives you sort of this impression there's a lot going on there. But in terms of actually communicating that there's a sort of hierarchy information or what are the patterns or what should I look at, it doesn't do a great job at that. That gets more to something, going back to this, like think about the hierarchy. What, what is the part of the uh, image that you wanna show big? What are the parts that you wanna show small? Uh, and how many of you in here have read any of Edward Tufte's books? Have any of you? Oh, uh, you should all go uh, uh, read his books. Uh, Visual Display of Quantitative Information is sort of the classic book on data visualization along with, uh, he's done I think uh, three more visual explanations, envisioning information, 
the other one. Uh, but it's a great sort of look at like use the marrying design with visualization and displaying quantitative information. Uh, and one of the things he talks about is getting rid of chart junk, um, which is a hugely important thing and which sadly is a default for a lot of sort of graphing programs. Um, this is a great example from uh, Dark Horse Analytics about uh, you have a chart that looks like this. How do you actually, if you really want to communicate information uh, in the most effective way, uh, what's wrong with this? And you just step through, like, first, let's remove the background, remove redundant labels, remove the borders, reduce the number of colors, remove the special effects, remove the bolding, lighten up the labels, lighten up the lines, remove, or may just remove them all together, put your labels right in the chart, and all of a sudden you've gone from something that's actually a piece that's sort of screaming at you with all these things that are actually distracting you from the actual data to something that is actually a much clearer uh, presentation uh, of the data itself. And if you look at actually a lot of what we do in the Times in way of graphics, you'll see that we are usually have just sort of the minimum amount of uh, labeling and annotation and axes on the charts to uh, give people a sense of scale, but we don't want any actual information in there that sort of distracts from that. Uh, Edward Tufte also talks about what he calls the data to ink ratio which is the ratio of uh, the amount of data you're conveying to the amount of ink you have on the page. And things like the borders around, the piece, uh, around this and the excess labels are basically just adding ink that doesn't actually add any extra data. So think about how do you actually get it so that like, everything that you're actually uh, plotting onto people is really adding uh, useful information. Um, color, I think uh, your speaker on Monday probably talked about this some. Um, as we think about colors for uh, indicating ranges on things, um, our general rule of thumb is that you use intensity to indicate the sort of range along a scale. If we're gonna make a map of the US that showed the percentage of the population that was in poverty, what we would do is for areas that had a, uh, uh, we'd pick basically one color for the entire map, where it'd be this gonna be a map that's basically done in gr shades of green. And areas that don't have a lot of poverty are very light. Areas that uh, have uh, a lot of poverty are very dark. Um, and areas in the middle are sort of a middle uh, color. Um, meanwhile, uh, if you have sort of categorical variables, uh, where it's discrete categories, uh, for example, counties that voted for Obama or counties that voted for Romney, that's when you actually use, change the hue and use different colors. Um, so if it is sort of a like rate or sort of intensity, you wanna think about having your colors be done through shading. If it is sort of discrete categories, um, that's uh, when you use uh, sort of different colors for different parts of your chart or your map. Uh, stick to a limited color palette. Uh, the vast majority of graphics in the Times uh, use one of these uh, approximately maybe 30 or so colors. Um, it's easy for the sort of presence to color to sort of overwhelm everything. Um, and by having that sort of limited color palette, it both establishes a visual consistency from piece to piece, um, but also helps prevent you from just like making your graphic uh, look like it's going over the rainbow. Uh, Confused about colors, there's two great resources. Color Brewer uh, is something, uh, a site made by uh, Cynthia Brewer. Um, that looks at, gives you sample color palettes to use. Uh, and she's a, a professor at Pennsylvania State uh, who's done a consulting for the Census Bureau, amongst others, and has done a lot of work on how people actually perceive colors. So if you have a sort of sequential uh, color palette or sequential data, you can, uh, she will actually give you uh, different color values. You can say, I want seven shades uh, that are uh, easily, easily distinguishable from each other. Or if you have 
diverging data. For example, uh, you have data where it's percentage of people who either like margin of victory for either Romney or uh, Obama. You can plot it out where sort of places are about 50-50 are the light shades in the middle, heavily Obama, dark blue, heavily Obama, uh, light blue. But then she can actually, she'll actually give you the uh, hex codes that you can use in a web page or your uh, graphing software for those uh, color ranges. A type, once again, uh, this is a thing I often see uh, with uh, sort of source data that we get or source graphics is that um, often you'll see just sort of like uh, many different type styles on a graphic um, or people trying to say, you know what, I have a graphic about the Wild West, uh, so I'll use like an old Wild West typeface. Uh, in general, if like the type, oh, if you're worrying about what font you're using, uh, other than something simple, like in the type is a focus of your graphic, you're probably doing something wrong. Um, so really focus on like, how can we actually just keep the type very simple, played back, and really make the visualizations uh, themselves pop. Once again, uh, going back to this graphic, the type here is all, there's only about uh, three type styles in here, maybe four type styles that are all pretty, uh, uh, coordinated and uh, we probably, these four type styles probably are used in 95% of the graphics we do. Uh, illustration, um, uh, there's, I think nothing makes a graphic look cheesier than sort of bad clip art, um, which is sort of easy to find. Um, I would say just as a stylistic thing, when in doubt, use icons, the pictograms, um, or uh, often uh, can help uh, give a little visual impression uh, while maintaining a fairly sort of elegant style um, and not distracting from the graphic. And that's looking at, like, this is a graphic we did about uh, uh, the deal uh, with Iran over uh, their nuclear refining, just using simple illustrations uh, to really help walk people through what would otherwise be a very text-heavy graphic. But stylistically, these are all pretty simply done. Um, and Uh, the Noun Project uh, is a website uh, that has oops, oops, over here. Uh, icons done in a very similar style for many, many things, including actually uh, on the homepage right now, a number of uh, astronomy-related things. Uh, but pretty much anything you want. Uh, They will have a whole uh, variety of things. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's, not a, it's not free, but it's actually pretty reasonable um, in terms of uh, getting images. So, um, and because, because uh, the images are all done in that sort of similar uh, pictogram style, um, it's easy to actually take and combine multiple ones together in the same uh, graphic uh, and actually have it feel like it's a coordinated thing rather than having uh, multiple illustrations that feel like they have competing styles. Uh, interactivity, a uh, couple things to think about there. Uh, as we talked about before, like if you're actually building an interactive piece, really think about are you really using this to uh, explore data or to tell a story or actually trying to do both? Um, I'll just flip over here to the examples. Uh, we made a So this is a calculator on, uh, is it better to rent or to buy a house? Um, where this is much more of the exploration range. You can dial in what's the price of the house you wanna buy, how long do you plan to stay, um, what's your mortgage details, and it'll tell you what the equivalent rent is. If you can rent for uh, less than that, you're coming out ahead. If you can rent for more than that, then you should buy. Uh, so that's really a sort of exploration uh, piece. Um, other things like our map of poverty in America is another thing where it's very much the point of this is to let people explore the map themselves. Uh, but then there's pieces that can actually do both, where you tell a story. We've made a map of 
uh, what uh, zip codes have the most uh, baseball fans for each team. Um, this is sort of see where boundaries uh, begin and end, which is sort of, you can explore, zoom in. Uh, you know what, I grew up in Iowa. Uh, it's mostly Cubs territory there. But then we also took that data and actually turned it into a uh, story where we uh, took out slices of that and actually put it together with text describing what was interesting about different regions of the country. So think about uh, the purpose. Um, and on the other end of the, uh, this sort of telling the story with data, uh, this is a graphic we did uh, a year or two ago about the record year for auto recalls, where we had a bunch of data on the amount of autos that were recalled this year. And the visualization here was very much in this form of a stepper to let people go through this like step by step and just uh, using these sort of moving cars on the high as a background just highlight the fact that one out of every five vehicles have been recalled, and where the recalled vehicles, what types uh, of recalls they were and where they came from. Um, and in this case, we're using the data and the visualization to tell a story. There's no, you're not actually drilling in here to actually find a specific car or uh, manufacturer. Uh, ben Schneiderman at the University of Maryland um, is uh, one of the pioneers in human-computer interaction. Um, he uh, has a visual information-seeking mantra, which is overview first, zoom and filter, then details on the demand, which I think is actually sort of a great way to think about any interactive piece that you do, um, is how do you make sure that when you actually uh, first load the piece, There's an over, like the visualization that you're seeing actually provides an overview of what the data is. Then you can actually take and zoom, zoom in on that data. You can filter it. This is a map of uh, Olympic medals uh, every year since uh, 1896, which countries got the most of them. And so you can filter back to say, all right, show me just medals in 1984. And you can then, the details on demand is, I want to see more information. What is the action I can take that says, let me click and see Great Britain, like how many medals do they win? I click and then it gives me the details on demand. Um, so just in a simple way of like very simple basic interface design for interactive visualizations, I think that's a great way to think about it, which is like that, what's the overview that your visualization is providing? How do you let people actually interact with it in some way that lets them adjust what they're seeing? And how do you make sure that they then can actually get details if they want? Um, uh, so uh, now we'll do a little bit of a lightning round on uh, some thoughts on just basically charting forms and mapping forms and sort of pitfalls uh, to watch out for or cases that you may want to use one thing or another. Uh, there's a uh, great uh, ch chart suggestions diagram that goes around the internet uh, that talks about uh, basically how do you find the appropriate charting form? What would you like to show? You're going to show a, com a comparison that you're doing, you got bar charts, you got line charts, you got column charts. If you want to show a relationship between two things, it's a scatter plot or a bubble chart. Distributions are histograms, uh, compositions, things that make up part of a whole. You have pie charts, you have stack column charts. Um, the simple version of this, which actually probably maps to, I would guess, 90% of the charts we uh, run in the New York Times, is of all those charts, probably these four are probably the most the basic ones, bar charts, line charts, scatter charts, and stack column charts. A slightly more expanded version includes a few more things like bubble charts, histograms, um, line charts with multiple lines, and uh, stack column charts that make a percentage of a whole. Um, you can go a long, long way with just a pretty simple array, uh, array of forms. Uh, Bar charts are sort of the workhorse chart that's probably the most popular thing or most common thing that we uh, publish. Usually they correspond to some sort of time series. Um, and the thing that's important to note about bar charts is the way we normally think about them is bar charts are something that are used for discrete quantities of events uh, where the uh, thing that you're charting resets each year or month or whatever the next period in your chart is. So this is waves of Cuban, Cuban immigration to Miami-Dade. Um, in 1960, there was just more than 15,000. When 1961 rolls again, around again, it starts over and it builds up by the end of the year. And so if you have something where the uh, population or what you're charting is not changing uh, from one to the other, uh, then uh, a bar chart is probably the way to go. 
Meanwhile, line charts we use more often for things where it is something that's moving continuously along a scale. Um, population going from India's population uh, here. The population doesn't reset for each year that you're plotting. It just grows or shrinks. So that's something that's more uh, analogous to a line chart because uh, if you're plotting a point here and the next point is here, like you expect that the population passes between those two points somewhere uh, in between uh, your uh, data points. Uh, pie charts. Uh, there's a lot of hate out there for pies. I think in most cases that's well deserved. Uh, Stephen Few, who does uh, data visualization, uh, talks about uh, has a post on saving the pies for dessert and just how people have a hard time judging uh, relative sizes of angles. Uh, you can see in this view of this pie chart that company C is pretty close to, tw is well, exactly 25% of the chart. But the moment you start rotating things around, all of a sudden it's harder to gauge, like, well, what percentage of the whole is this triangle? We don't have the reference points. Uh, we almost never use pie charts in the times. Um, they're also awful to label, uh, generally, like having the key over here. Um, you can make them better by doing, like putting the actual company labels and the percentages on the side of the chart, but if you're doing that, you're probably actually better off just doing a bar chart like this um, and showing uh, what the relationship is, because it's easier to gauge the relative sizes of that to each of those companies to each other than it is in the uh, pie chart. Um, I will say there is one example, though, where pie charts, I think, actually do have an advantage, which is when the mid half matters. If it's important that you go above or below 50%, like, say, for example, if you're winning a presidential election, if this is a bar chart uh, where one of these two slides is slightly longer than the other, it's hard to tell which one is which. On a pie chart, it's actually pretty easy because you have that slight angle in there uh, that actually shows that half is more or less. Uh, stack bar, but unless half matters, then uh, you, uh, pie charts are typically avoided when you have a lot of categories. Uh, stack bars are what we use most of the time instead of pie charts, um, where we actually take and just uh, stack up the percentages on a bar. It's easier to see the relative sizes. You're not comparing angles. And also, it's usually easier to label here. Uh, group bars are another chart I see a lot coming in, uh, sort of charts we get from sources that we're working with. I find them to be sort of impenetrable to understand because you almost always have to have a key off to the side uh, that labels what each bar is. And then it's just sort of like, Am I supposed to be comparing these things to each other, or am I supposed to be comparing this point to 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 this point? To this point? Um, and they're usually a mess of colors, uh, so we almost never run group bar charts. Uh, and if we had something that was actually more like a group bar chart, we will often do it as sort of a bubble chart, where uh, instead of having bars for each year, we'll do a bubble so you can read both straight across and read down at the same time. People are worse at per perceiving uh, areas of things than they are at lengths. But compared to the sort of visual noise of trying to bounce around between the different bars, uh, this always seems like a better trade-off to me. Uh, bullet charts are actually one of my favorite styles also in terms of like, uh, if you do have two values that you want to compare to each other that you do as a group bar, doing one as a sort of smaller uh, black line uh, sitting on top of a thicker light shade in the background is sort of a good way to actually see how uh, one thing measures up to the whole. So here's comparing the uh, percentage of children who are low achievers in uh, various subjects for girls versus boys. Uh, in this case, uh, you can see the places where the girls uh, come up the shortest compared to the boys and the places where they uh, are, uh, or actually I guess not come the shortest, they're probably actually doing better if, they're not, if there's fewer lower achievers, or the places where it's uh, closer to each other. Uh, bubble charts. Um, are uh, something that we do use. We try not to use overuse them because people are actually very bad uh, at gauging the relative sizes of circles. Uh, but they're great for a few things, one being when you need to actually uh, display differences that are like really in sort of orders of magnitudes uh, between each other. Um, if you were to plot these values as straight bar charts, um, the uh, big bars would be so tall you wouldn't be able to see any patterns amongst the smaller bars because they'd all be so short. Um, they're also pretty good for getting a lot of information in a compact amount of space. Plus, in cases like this, uh, this is looking at the words that, uh, how often different presidents use words of the State of the Union address. They do let you sort of line things up to be compared both horizontally and vertically. Um, and they are really great for being very space efficient um, in terms of being able to, because you're, 
um, expanding out exponentially, uh, being able to pack a lot of data in a small space in terms of relative sizes. Uh, scatter plots are, I'm sure, a staple of your world. Um, one of the, they are one of the charting forms that I think we probably get the most feedback from people who don't deal with scatter plots on a regular basis that they don't necessarily know what to take away from them, or like they're a little bit harder to understand at first glance. As bar chart or line chart or pie chart is fairly straightforward. Scatter plot is used for when you have a relationship between obviously a variable down here on one axis and a variable on the other axis. One of the things I think is always good to do is try and actually uh, put some reference points or reference lines on scatter plots that actually explain like how can you help people understand what the relationship is here. So in this case, um, there's a, we put a, about the relationship between men and women's earnings in different education or different occupations. Uh, we put a line that says, here's a line, if men and women had equal wages, you can see the fields where women earn more than men, and then put lines for women earn 10% less than men, women earn 20% less than men, women earn 30% less than men, to really just help people, give them clues to like walk through that. Uh, connected scatter plots, I think, are also a lot of fun. Uh, this is a chart about how uh, the relationship between the amount of miles Americans drive on average every year and the oil prices, where it was just plotted out year by year how uh, as uh, the uh, amount of miles, year by year you can see the amount of miles driven per year going up, but then all of a sudden when oil prices uh, go up, uh, you can see that that sort of gradual increase goes back um, uh, or halts uh, and with this uh, spike uh, a few years ago, really how the uh, miles per year uh, fell as the price went up. Um, so that's a sort of other fun way of uh, charting things. Uh, area charts um, are basically charts that are a percentage of the whole. Um, this probably may also be a staple of your world. One thing to be aware with them is, for example, this is an area chart of uh, uh, market share uh, from an example about why area charts are bad. Um, the thing is about area charts is people, what we're plotting generally is this distance here, but what people actually perceive is that distance on the diagonal. So uh, most of the time, uh, a stacked column chart actually is better at uh, communicating than an area chart uh, because here, you don't get the sense that the, you get less of a sense that at the very end, the orange uh, part is falling completely to zero, whereas on the stack column part, you see this completely dropped away. Uh, tree maps are another uh, uh, interesting visualization form uh, that can be really useful in some cases. They're great for sort of showing hierarchies of things. Um, the best thing tree maps are used for, uh, in my mind, in the history of the world, are helping you find, visualize all the files on your hard drive and uh, let you find where the big ones are. Um, and so this is basically, each file on your hard drive is drawn as a box. Uh, each, uh, the files are then drawn as a, uh, grouped into the directory, the folder structure they're in, so you can just look at it and see, hey, you know what, I got a lot of drill into this uh, big file here and see, like, what is this file? Like, why is it sitting up there? How do I actually find that uh, file that's buried away in some folder that I can't, have never seen before? Um, uh, they can be a little bit complex to understand, but in terms of actually when you have that hierarchical relationship are great. Um, this is a graphic we did about uh, auto sales that's done as a tree map where um, basically each group of the tree map is uh, a auto company uh, that's then broken down by the models that they sell and broken down into uh, trucks, uh, SUVs and vans and cars. And each box in here is sized by the amount of sales in that year. So it looks you, lets you really quickly zoom in and see uh, what are the biggest sailors uh, in the US, what companies do they belong to, um, and you can color it by how much sales are up or down, um, and we can be really effective at that. Uh, cumulative charts uh, are when you hit charts that va uh, value that's sort of cumulative over time. Um, you see them a lot with uh, world uh, health crisis charts. You see like the cumulative number of cases uh, of uh, Ebola in Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone. They're great at sort of showing how things go up. Uh, the danger with them, however, is that sometimes you can overfocus uh, on the fact that things are going up because you're just sort of cumulatively reporting the number of cases and lose sight of the fact that uh, the actual peak of the epidemic is when the slope on the graphs is the highest 
and that at this point, when they sort of level off, this actually doesn't mean there's new cases. So similar plot of this data is, this is the number of new cases each week, which gives a different picture of it, which is, you can see here, okay, what was the point at which you're adding the most new cases? And you can see that it drops off now. Uh, with a cumulative, oops. Uh, with a cumulative chart, it's harder to realize that once it basically flattens off the end, that means that there's no more new cases going on. Uh, but cumulative charts are great in some cases, like this is a chart we did about uh, Stephen Curry's three-pointers, cumulative number of uh, three-pointers uh, three pointers shot by the uh, three-point record holder each season over the course of the season. And you can just see every other season, like people are clustered in a band and just how much further out ahead he is than everyone else. Uh, let's see, let me jump forward here a little bit. Uh, histograms are great for showing distributions. Let me, let me, uh, I'll, I want to get to a couple other quick things. Uh, tab charts, I think one thing often, uh, that's probably one of the most effective things we do in the paper is sort of mix charts and uh, tabular material together in the paper, where it's a uh, combination of here's a table plus actually charting values in the table. Um, it's a surprisingly sort of simple thing to do. Um, in terms of design, but I think it's something that often can get overlooked because we think of the charts differently than sort of tabular material. Um, but they can be kind together to actually work pretty well. We can talk about a couple of some, uh, some pitfalls of things to watch out for and a couple other things. Uh, small multiples, this is also Edward Tufte will talk a lot about these. If there's one trick in the book that it turns, uh, can turn charts into sort of compelling stories uh, and you can use is the idea of, creating small multiples of graphics, and how can you actually string together a repetitive series of the same type of thing where you highlight a different thing on each uh, image to really uh, show how things compare to each other or s show how things have changed over time. So in this case, this is plotting out where uh, fatalities in Baghdad occurred year by year. So the small multiple is, you have a multiple of the, uh, the map of Baghdad with each year's plotted on that, but actually stringing together that series uh, really helps uh, convey a little bit more of a story and give people a common reference point between charts. Um, and they can actually see how that went up or down. Uh, also great for things like, uh, this compares, uh, looks at which recipes uh, are popular around Thanksgiving in different states. And by having that sort of rep repetitive small pattern of uh, which states were highest in searches for uh, things like sweet potatoes or uh, turkey or yams or so forth, you can compare things to each other. Uh, other thing always also think about uh, in terms of charting things, how can you actually give people a reference point that makes sense to them? Um, this actually may, may have some sense in the astronomy world. Um, thinking about uh, this graphic we did a long time ago about uh, a new dinosaur uh, fossil that had been found uh, and figuring out how big it was compared to T-Rex. Um, that's a fine comparison of how big that dinosaur is to T-Rex, but it's actually uh, more effective when you put them next to a city bus. So always think like, is there a real world thing you can relate things to? Likewise, a uh, chart uh, was asked to do once about uh, how big the average home, how the average home size and average lot size had changed since uh, 1970 to 2000. Like that'd be easy to do as a series of two bar charts, but it's actually, if you think about how can we just actually show people a picture of the house and the lot sizes, uh, that actually is better at giving people a reference point of how big houses were compared to how big uh, lots were. Uh, normalizing, always think, am I actually normalizing my data down to uh, something that makes sense? This is probably, should be hopefully pretty obvious, but number of violent crimes in California uh, versus Nevada, California way out ahead. Uh, but if you adjust it per capita, uh, Nevada comes out ahead. So always think like, don't get high, like, is the raw number the thing I actually want to chart or is it actually, um, should I normalize it by something? Um, this can actually, normalizing, like the idea of normalizing things can also lead to fun ideas too. Uh, like this is a graphic we did uh, about uh, world records uh, where we normalized uh, the world records uh, in the different uh, running events at the Olympics to uh, a uh, number of seconds per 100 meters to show people not only how the world record progressed but how fast people in the 100 meter dash ran compared to the 200 meter dash and so forth. Uh, pitfalls. Uh, Zero baselining. Um, when you're making a chart, it's easy for uh, a lot of charting programs will default to just sort of showing you the range of the chart. You should always think about um, the range of the data. Uh, in many cases, though, you, should, you want to start your baseline of the chart at zero, not at an arbitrary amount like 10%. 
um, because if you take this chart and adjust it so that instead of being on a scale over here of 10 to 30, you go from uh, 0 to 100, it gives you a different picture. Um, or here, for example, is a, what the urbanization rate in China looks like. When they plotted this data, the, the baseline arbitrarily starts at 30% and goes to 50%. But if you were to do that from 0 to 50, that's a different sort of visual impression people take away from the slope of the chart. Or if you do it from 0 to 100, that's a different, different impression. So think about what is the actual uh, baseline. Obviously, like, should you start your chart at 0? In most cases, the answer should be yes, except in cases where, for example, like the stock market, if you're interested in the intraday fluctuations of data, like it doesn't make any, which are very small compared to something overall, that it doesn't make sense, um, or things like, Temperature charts make ne almost never make sense to baseline at zero because zero doesn't actually mean anything in temperatures. It's just an arbitrary point. Uh, particular pet peeve of mine, charts with double axes. Um, I see this a lot also where you have two charts where there's one axis for Apple stock prices on the left, the other for Microsoft. Because you can be very arbitrary about how you set your axes, um, it's easy for people to take different things away from this, like here. Like, Microsoft had a much higher stock price than Apple, and they both sort of trended up uh, based on these axes. But if you change the axes for uh, Apple and Microsoft to be on different scales, all of a sudden, Apple looks like it's doing way better, which it is. Um, much better to actually say, what's the percent, like, can we identify a common starting point and say, what's the actual percent change in stock price? Uh, for both of them since that starting point and plot that, and you see that Microsoft is barely up while Apple has skyrocketed, or even better yet, if we invested $1,000 in 2004, what would that be worth? Apple $72,000, Microsoft $2,000. So being able to, so setting those like arbitrary scales on the charts, whoops, uh, on the double axes, you can adjust them to make it look however you want. So always try and find ways to avoid that. Uh, if you're ever plotting bubble charts, always do it by area, uh, not radius, because uh, since it's uh, sized in both directions, it, the relationship expands exponentially. Um, so if you plot things with a radius of f uh, four instead of uh, area of four, uh, the relationship between one, two, and four, this is actually four times as big as that, which is four times as big as that. Simple way to think about this, if you actually do is just squares and divide them up into boxes, um, you would never say that this is four times that, but we see, I see this all the time in terms of people plotting bubble charts where they size it by, not by the square root of the chart, but by the, um, uh, but by the uh, radius or diameter of it. Uh, choose an appropriate scale. Scales are very important. Uh, this is a chart about the number of combat deaths per month in Iraq, which is that's probably an appropriate scale for that. Uh, but knowing what actually you're comparing, think about what you're comparing it to. If you actually compare combat deaths in Iraq compared to Vietnam, then all of a sudden you see how that drops uh, in terms of the relative scale of that to that. And compared to World War II, um, you just see how much bigger that is. So think about like what is the, what is the scale that you want to have as a reference point uh, on the side. Uh, this is a graphic that ran comparing deaths in the different wars and just the scale of World War II compared to Iraq and Vietnam was just staggering to me the first time I applied of that. Um, and then always think about, like, is uh, the charting form that you have the sort of clearest that it could be? Um, often when we come to data visualization, people will set, find a really sort of interesting visual pattern, like a very complex, like a form that, like, looks great um, in terms of sort of like a visual uh, pattern. This is uh, a chart uh, I saw about how obesity is inversely proportional to the average education of the population that compared the obesity rate uh, in each state to the uh, population with a college degree or higher. Um, and you see this nice pattern of like states with a high number of college degrees actually have a low obesity rate and vice versa. It's sort of an interesting visual pattern. Uh, the problem is though, if like the actually much simpler way to do that would just be to do, just do a bar chart that says, what's the obesity rate for college graduates compared to less than college graduates? So always think about like, or can you actually do this in a simpler way to actually make your point? Don't get hung up on like interesting visual patterns just for the sake of having an interesting visual. Um, avoid uh, 3D. Uh, 3D can uh, add all sorts of distortions because uh, as you add 3D, the relative size of things uh, gets scaled up. Um, so uh, it's often a default in graphing programs. We almost never do it in the times. Um, this is a chart that somebody made uh, joking about us where they, uh, 
there's a graphics competition where they wanted to uh, minimize the size of the New York Times uh, pie uh, for the chart, uh, so they put us uh, in the background uh, so that the foreshadowing or the perspective uh, diminished us while highlighting the others. So. Uh, but there are times that it's really important. Here's a, this is a great 3D chart we did of the bond yield curve over time. Um, let me find, I want to find a couple other quick points uh, to make on mapping, and then I'll uh, give a brief, the brief D3 example. Uh, so mapping, a couple important things to think about making maps, uh, which we make a lot of uh, in the astronomy world. I assume you make maps, probably just not of the uh, world, but of the skies. Uh, but of making maps of the world, uh, one important thing to think about, this is a great XKCD comment about uh, many maps are just uh, basically population maps. Uh, our site's users correlate with subscribers to Martha Stewart Living, uh, consumers of furry pornography. Um, but really all it is is says, you know what, there's a lot of people living in these areas. So if it's just, think about sh should I be adjusting my data based on where people are or population or normalizing for that. Um, thinking about what purpose maps bring, there's a few different purposes. One is just provide spatial clarity. Where, where are we finding things? How, are we, uh, where, how can we help people find where in the world or the skies something uh, appeared? This is just a map showing uh, where uh, Malaysian Airlines Flight 17 crashed. And this is just, the point of this is to both show what happened but just really orient people. Maps are also used for showing patterns. Um, and think about, is the point of your map to actually show where something is or to actually show patterns and then you approach things differently? This actually shows uh, patterns and where the different airlines flew around the Ukraine. You can see the patterns in Malaysia Airlines um, and Thai Airways continued to fly over the Ukraine, uh, whereas uh, British Airways, Lufthansa, and Air France did not. Um, or uh, this is a map of uh, presidential election results uh, in, uh, I think it's 2004, overlaid with cotton plantations in the south, showing how the cotton plantations uh, correlated with where Obama had won, uh, which is because they were uh, historically African-American uh, communities. And so the point of this map is to not, is to really sort of like highlight those patterns, not to really help people find a specific spot. Uh, but then there are other maps where the point of the map is to find them, let people find themselves. Um, and so on a map like this about states planning to expand Medicaid, um, this is less of a map about like, is there any regional pattern in states planning to find Medicaid, but rather just a very efficient way um, for someone to say, oh, I live in Iowa, we, are lean, we will not expand, or I live in Montana, we will expand. So that's another very important purpose of maps. Um, and uh, last thing I'll uh, talk about on mapping uh, is uh, also the visual impression that uh, maps give uh, and how you should be thinking about always considering like what are people actually taking away when they look at the map. So this is a map of the 2008 uh, popular vote in the Obama-McCain race uh, colored by county, uh, whether Obama won or McCain won. It's a perfectly fine map. If, uh, we could publish it in the Times uh, with uh, be perfectly factually correct. Um, there's only one problem with the map, though, in terms of how people actually look at that, which is if you look at what the popular vote was, Obama got 68 million uh, votes, McCain got uh, 59 million. Um, so Obama, like, well, he obviously won the race for president. Uh, but if you actually look at the square miles of uh, red and blue on that map, you have 850,000 square miles of blue, 2 million square miles of red. So the impression actually someone takes away from this is actually the country, like, is a very red country when in terms of the actual voters, uh, it's less that case. So as we were thinking about how do we actually want to display election results, like that's one of the things we always think about is like what's the visual impression that people take away from things like maps. So we started looking for like is there, are there better ways to actually do this? Like can we at least, instead of being straight red or blue, let's shade the counties by whether they're a strong Obama or strong McCain or sort of the middle, that helps somewhat. You can do things like use cartograms that distort the size of each county by the number of voters. Uh, which is, I, I love cartograms and there's many ways you can do this, them. Um, and this is uh, super fun. I'm not sure you can publish it in the Times and actually have anybody expect to recognize that this is Cook County uh, sh for Chicago and this is uh, Brooklyn over here and make that out. 
Uh, 3D is another thing you can use. Here's your maps, uh, where, but where each county is extruded by the margin of victory. This actually helps in some ways, but still has problems where the margin of victory in Chicago is about the same as Los Angeles, but because Los Angeles is a physically bigger county, it feels more dominant on the map. Uh, we did a thing in 2004 where we just whited out any area that had less than four people per square mile, uh, which is a different, fixes a lot of problems out west, you still have problems about density of cities versus suburban areas and so forth. Um, and ultimately, what we ended up doing and settling on was a proportional symbols map where um, you have different, uh, the, the size of the symbol on top of each county corresponds with the actual margin of uh, victory in that county. So that if you were actually to sum up all the red and blue uh, sides of the map, it would actually correspond to uh, uh, the actual, uh, the difference would match with the difference in the actual vote. And because, but there's problems with that too, like you can't make out what's going on over here. So you think about like, what is the purpose that each form has? So like what we actually ran included a mix of, here's a big map showing the margin of victory that we wanted to be the dominant image. But then for people who actually wanted to actually see more details about what's going on in the Northeast, we had a smaller map that actually let, that was just colored by the vote by county um, that actually let people um, dig in to uh, see more details there. So think about like what are those different forms communicating? Um, I'm gonna get, uh, dive into a little bit of uh, a couple of the D3 examples or just one of the D3 examples right now because um, we have about 30 minutes left and want to make sure you guys all see that. Um, So uh, as you've seen with a lot of the interactive pieces, uh, we, use a piece of so we use a JavaScript library called D3 uh, to do a lot of the plotting of data visualization. Uh, is everyone in here familiar with, uh, uh, with uh, HTML? Or how many people are familiar with HTML? Or how many people, how many people are not familiar with HTML? OK, so a fair amount. Uh, and how many people? Uh, how many people are not familiar with JavaScript? All right. How many people are not familiar with Python? All right. So, so we're better on the Python front. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, let's see. So. Uh, most of the graphics that we use that uh, are done, data visualization, are uh, done using uh, D3, uh, where the, at least the interactive ones, uh, which basically is a way of letting us easily load data files and then map them over to uh, HTML, uh, generate web pages or interactive web pages from uh, based on the data. Um, and so this is a chart about the uh, words uh, that were used at political conventions. Um, where we're using D3, which is a, it's like a Python, it's a JavaScript library in the same way that Python has libraries uh, that really allows for data manipulation. Um, and so uh, in this case, all the interactivity is delivered through JavaScript on, that's running on your web browser and lets you do fun things like both uh, click on, click on your elements of your data to change, like in the uh, details that are being displayed displayed down below, here's all the references to Romney, but also actually let people interact with things like drag it around for fun, or add a word or phrase like, uh, nobody mentioned physics. <laughs> well, science might be a, oh, science is in there. Oh, science is already in there, uh, whatever it is. Uh, Science doing better than liberal arts. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's sort of the uh, stalwart of what we use um, for actually making uh, interactive data graphics. Um, uh, 
Uh, here's the website for D3 is just d3js.org. It's written by Mike Bostock. Uh, he actually worked for a few years for us at the Times. Uh, after he'd started D3, uh, he actually, uh, we managed to get him to come uh, work in the graphics department for a few years uh, before he decided to return to uh, just working on D3 full time. Uh, but uh, Mike is a huge believer in the power of examples and tutorials. So one of the great things about D3 um, is that um, Mike has a full library of uh, here's all sorts of, here's what sample code is to, you wanna make a bubble chart? Um, here's what the code is to make that bubble chart. Um, or you want to, So errors on the side of, uh, you wanna make a heat map, here's what the code looks like for that. Uh, Mike has also made a couple uh, uh, great tutorials. I'll just uh, walk through uh, the basic one right now on let's make a chart. Uh, these are the sample files that are up in your GitHub repo. Um, but uh, in terms of things, if you actually wanna dive into this, the thing to do is to actually just go yourself, go walk through the let's make a chart tutorial and see uh, how that works. Uh, for you, it's a great sort of step-by-step -step going from making a basic chart just by coding it by hand in HTML to using D3 to generate it dynamically to then loading data from an external file um, and actually uh, being able to load in, uh, data in to use it from files like a CSV file or a tab-separated uh, file. Um, Scott Murray also has a lot of tutorials. Um, so this is just the example I'm gonna do right now. Um, because D3 ru runs in a uh, web browser, uh, usually it's easiest to actually run a little web server in your computer to actually uh, load so that you can actually uh, have your computer behave like it's connecting to a web server. For those of you who are not actually familiar with this in Python, Python has a great little uh, module called Simple HTTP Server that will start a web server in whatever directory you're in on your computer. So. Um, I'll just go walk through this right now and you can follow along or you can uh, follow along in Mike's tutorial at your own time. So let's do. So if you actually, if you clone your, the Git repo. Yeah, let me see if I can. So if you clone that Git repo, if you, uh, once you clone the Git repo, everyone in here is familiar with the terminal? Okay, I was, I was told everyone was, so uh, that's great. Uh, if you, uh, if you change CD into that directory, um, if you run that python-m simple HTTP server, that will start a web server on your computer uh, that's in that directory. That then if you go to localhost colon 8000, it will show you all the files in that directory. And Basically, uh, this uh, there's basically it's just you click on the first file is just like your basic bar chart, and it just works through up making it a little bit fancier with each time. Um, but I'll just pop open the code here uh, to actually walk you through what it does. Um, so it is uh, make this bigger too. Right. 
Can you guys see that or does that need to be? So if we look at this chart over here in HTML, just this very first file, um, this is a chart that's not actually being drawn dynamically at all. This is a chart that's just coded in HTML um, and is done in a pretty simple way. So uh, the HTML for this uh, that draws this chart right here uh, is uh, right over here. And basically all you're doing here is, for those of you familiar with HTML, uh, HTML has a concept of a div, which is basically a shape on a page. Um, and all we're doing is defining, there's a class called a chart, and that class has some rectangles on it that are set to a specific width. Uh, in this case, uh, 40 pixels, 80 pixels, 150 pixels, 160 pixels, 230 pixels, which are proportional to the values we're plotting, which over here are the same type of thing where it's uh, 4, 8, 15, 16, 23, 42. Uh, so this is, this is not a dynamically generated chart. It's not using D3 at all. You obviously don't want to code your charts by hand this way because that would be incredibly tedious. Um, and so the great thing about what D3 does is that basically D3 lets you uh, use data to actually uh, generate HTML uh, or HTML elements on a page so that your, what, you're, uh, what you're plotting is tied to that data. Um, and so, uh, if you work through the tutorial, um, this, is the, this is a tutorial Mike will walk you through uh, basically step by step coding the chart manually, coding the chart automatically, and what does what. What we basically are doing here is in HTML, um, this is the part that starts, we start to introduce D3 where um, it's very similar to the previous version in that you're still setting some styles. Here's what your, here's what your color of your chart is. Here's what, uh, uh, what the uh, sort of size of it is in terms of the amount of padding and margin. Um, here you still have that, but instead of actually having to hand code your elements down here where you're writing that, the HTML up by hand, um, what D3 is actually doing is taking um, and, uh, oops. and if here's your data in an array right here in JavaScript, uh, D3 lets you then take and uh, set a scale for that data and then uh, lets you take and basically D3 that selects says we're gonna select a chart element on the page and we're going to join the divs, that chart element, with the actual data. And when that join occurs, uh, this is when it's the enter that append, we're going to set the width of that bar based on uh, the, uh, uh, based on the actual value in the data. So it's, you set the style of the width based on uh, the value in the actual data. Um, so, when you load this page, it actually looks exactly the same because it's actually under the hood is generating exactly the same HTML. Uh, but it's actually at the point where if I go over here and now I change this number to 15, I re. Oops. I reload my page and that uh, chart redraws itself. If I change this to 35, I reload my page, all of a sudden it takes and plots it out. Uh, plots it out. Um, bar charts are like the, probably the most simple way to do this um, using HTML. Um, there's also, are you, are you guys familiar with SVG files? Who, who, is, uh, who is not familiar with SVG? So SVG is a, SVG is a vector image format um, that is uh, similar. Uh, that can be embedded in web pages, um, sort of like a uh, sort of like a, any sort of like a JPEG uh, file or a GIF. But because it's a vector image, you can draw it dynamically on the fly. You're not actually having to paint pixels. Um, 
And so uh, if you're just drawing rectangles on a page, you can use HTML divs to draw rectangles, but the moment that you need to move into drawing shapes like uh, circles or lines or so forth, then you need to stop using HTML and move on to SVG. So the uh, third step on here is, if you look at D3, of the tutorials, is changing it from, instead of, instead of down here generating HTML divs, uh, it changes it to generate uh, SVG graphics, which are uh, done by uh, a different type of element on the page. Uh, call, uh, you create an SVG element on the page, and it has a graphic element on it. Um, and this works exactly the same way. You have data, you, defining your data in an array. It's creating, selecting, creating the uh, chart on the page. Uh, up here, where you uh, define the source, the HTML source of the page, we're creating the chart element. So uh, what uh, D3 is doing is saying, find that chart element we created on the page. We're going to set the width and height of it to values we def defined up here. Um, and then we're going to uh, draw graphic shapes, which are a G element uh, inside it. Uh, that has uh, sized according to the uh, height of the bar and the uh, width of the data. And then we're going to draw the text on top of it. And so this works exactly the same way as the previous one, where if we take and we change a value here, we regenerate it changes over there. Um, and we can also do things like say, you know what, I want my bars uh, to be drawn at a different height, 70 pixels. Reload it, regenerate it. Um, and because this is just being done in a web page, um, we have, uh, we can start integrating H the sort of text with it also, just like any other sort of web HTML document. Whoops. So if we just go into that document and we say, go into the, uh, we can just use normal HTML and place that right around the chart. Um, and have that integrated uh, in the page. Uh, the other thing that D3 is really good at is it makes it easy to also load data from external files. So obviously, in this previous example, you don't want to have to hard code your actual data that you're plotting in the source of the page. Um, so if you have things like data in a JSON file or an XML file or a CSV file or a, a tab-separated value file, um, D3 has commands for going in and uh, saying, let's load this uh, CSV data from, the data, from a data.csv file. So our CSV file just has it's like name, value. And then, uh, so then we're loading the data from that CSV file into a data variable. Um, and using that data variable to plot out uh, the uh, width of uh, the width of the var based on that value column in that file. And then because we're loading the data from file, we can also do things like, say, the previous chart we uh, had, uh, we drew the width of the uh, chart, uh, the bar, based on the value of the file. But we can also uh, use that data to say, let's put a text label on top of it that has the name of the person uh, in the file. And just sort of dynamically uh, work on uh, building up a web page or a based off of uh, inserting SVG elements or HTML elements into the document. Um, and it also is, uh, makes it easy to do things like add interactivity. This is obviously gets much more complex. Um, but because you're sort of using the same underlying JavaScript uh, that web pages use, you can start to uh, have interaction between the data elements in your uh, web page and also the charts in your web page. Um, that's the very brief introduction. Um, 
there's a few things about D3. D3 is incredibly powerful. Um, you do actually have to dive into learning HTML and CSS and JavaScript to really make great use of it. Um, so uh, it's not like it's not a sort of simple like pick this up and say I want to start making charts overnight. Um, it actually does have a bit of a learning curve. Uh, but the thing is the great is that it does actually give you a lot of power. Um, and Mike uh, has a great site called blocks.org where it is just um, dozens and dozens of examples of uh, if you want to make uh, a map of the world in the particular projection, here's what your HTML needs to look like to do that. Um, and here is uh, all the JavaScript that is used to draw that map of the world. Um, or uh, you want to make different, uh, visualize different types of things. If you want to show uh, a map, a a uh, map that has uh, bubbles sized by population on it. Uh, here's uh, the HTML to do that. You can see the D3 JavaScript code that is used to do that. Um, and where the data, it actually gives you commands to download, a make file to download uh, the data files used uh, for the map. And so um, it's a great way to actually just dive in and uh, start looking at different ways uh, and different sort of like basic code for generating charts in different forms. Now, when, when um, in the old times when I did some of this stuff, there was this model called the model view, uh, what's it called, uh, MVC. Yep. Does JavaScript use that in, in this? I mean, how, does it use like a main loop and it just goes over events and acts on the events? Or you can, yeah, you, we, you, can, you can attach events to different, uh, or event handlers to different objects to say once you put it, uh, using JavaScript, uh, you could say once you draw these bars on the page, you say anytime anybody hovers over the bar, call a function that should make that bar red. Or anytime somebody clicks on the bar, take the, uh, take the name of that person and run a query for any data that has that name. Um, so it does work in that way, where it's like you can attach events to the different uh, visual elements on the page and take actions based on them. Okay, so in that sense, they've not done something very new. They've just followed the old paradigm. Uh, they have. The thing that's actually kind of that's interesting um, is the sort of like binding of the actual da underlying data to actually how it's being drawn on the screen. So you can make it so that if you actually change that underlying data, it just automatically redraws itself. So, uh, but it's. Uh, once you, actually, once you actually sort of get your mind wrapped around it, it actually can be really powerful in terms of like letting you iterate quickly on different charting forms. So uh, the example I showed of the corporate tax rates, all those uh, variants of the different charts were generated pretty quickly by Mike using uh, D3. So uh, more D3 questions? I think we have about five minutes left, so. Uh, you can do 3D in it in, I think, different ways. Uh, uh, I think 3D, though, you often end up using, uh, I'm less up to speed on uh, uh, how exactly we did this, uh, but we did a 3D, uh, a 3D uh, chart of the bond yield curve. Let's see, where is this? Uh, this might be using uh, one of the other, there's a couple of three, JavaScript 3D libraries also. Uh, but there are ways you can actually do that. Uh, any other questions? Either about D3 or anything else? So, or are we? Yeah. 